There are many dark secrets buried in this small African-American town. Now at least two generations removed from the race riots that occurred in 1917, the city still suffers from the dubious distinction as one of the most dangerous places in America. Trapped, it seems, in the time warp of the early century, East St. Louis still has the makeup of a corporate deserted town with shanty houses, poverty, and yes, corruption. East St. Louis was known for lawlessness and corruption practically from the day it incorporated. In fact, the very first chief executive of what is now East St. Louis was removed from office because he just simply left town after two months. Kind of unusual. By the 1880s, East St. Louis was a lawless place because there were islands along the Mississippi where jurisdictions were questioned and gambling was, was open and up front. Liquor consumption was, was very high. The city was one of the fastest growing metropolises in America. It boasted an abundance of railroads, factories, and packing houses, but it was most famous for its gunfights and after-hour saloons and brothels. They at one time had two police forces in East St. Louis. They had a state police force, and then they had a local one. And the two police forces got in a gun battle one day, Shoot, started shooting at each other. Uh, give you some idea about the schizophrenic nature of a, of a city like this, okay? African Americans from the South who came to East St. Louis during the turn of the century were financially strapped families looking to find a break in the system. After hearing stories of how other blacks prospered outside the South, unassuming blacks naively fled the South thinking salvation was on the horizon. By the thousands, blacks were lured to East St. Louis, Illinois by crooked politicians and industrial reps to work in factories and packing houses because they were willing to work for far lesser wages than their white counterparts. I, I remember very vividly um, sitting at the knee of my, my grandfather, listening to my father talk about how when they left, both being uh, children of the South, coming to East St. Louis, not because they heard that East St. Louis was uh, the land of milk and honey for black people, but because that there were jobs to be had in East St. Louis, that a person could come up from the South and have a job within 24 hours here in East St. Louis. And that's the way it was with all of the packing houses and, 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 uh, and companies of that ilk. A black man could come up, uh, acquire a job within 24 hours, save his monies, and then later send for his family and bring them up from Mississippi, from Georgia, from Tennessee, and from all of these other southern places in which there was nothing for them to do other than to be sharecroppers or, or glorified slaves, as was my father and my, my grandfather. Blacks in the South were used to racism, and many believed it could not be worse than their situation in the South. At the time of crisis in the southern economy, Dixie senators believed the place for blacks was indeed the South. Uh, somebody said that in the South, they always, the difference in being from the South and being from the North, maybe it's Andrew Young, I'm not sure who said it, he said in the South they say, get as close as you want, just don't get too big. In the North they say, get as big as you want, just don't get too close. See, black people used to be a, a caring community for themselves. One would leave Mississippi or Georgia, Alabama and come to St. Louis, his family, and they'd get a, a place to stay. Then they send for the brother. You know, he'd come and stay with them until he found a job. Then he'd get another place. They sent for another brother or aunt or somebody else, family member. And then they kind of spread out. And what, as they did better, they would send for other people from the South, too. So it was, it was a hard working community, but it was a working community. The stockyards in East St. Louis provided jobs for African Americans. And there were certain jobs that were allocated just for, for black people, like in the service industry, working in hotels, bellhops, making beds for people street sweepers and street cleaners. But those were jobs. There were much better jobs than, than sharecropping on somebody's farm. And they worked hard sharecropping, put all of their monies into the crop, and the, peop the farmers, the white farmers, would come and take the crop and tell them that belonged to them. So they could have nothing down there at that time in certain areas there in the South. And so that's why those people had to come up here. The law at that time was that you don't question white folks. In fact, they would tell them, you trying to question this good white man, boy? You say, we let you and your folks stay on this, on this, on this plantation for, 
your granddaddy stayed here and your great granddaddy stayed here and you're going to question me? Now you go on back out there and, uh, and, and work that field. This was the, the, the attitude. They didn't even want him to go to school. My father and my uncle uh, had to hide in the fields by the railroad tracks until the white folks went to town before they could dash off to the schoolhouse. And if those white folks came back and discovered that they'd gone to school, they would in fact go to that schoolhouse, pull them back, put them back in the fields. This is the type of existence that blacks experienced in the South. Denied education, denied the opportunity to make a profit, to, to have self-determination. So many blacks determined that I'm gonna go north in search of a better life. So this is essentially what happened with many of the blacks who came uh, to East St. Louis. Industry reps determined to break the union, spread word to Southern blacks that East St. Louis was a place where you can get a new start. But Jim Crow was alive and well in East St. Louis, despite Illinois not having discriminatory legislation. Between 1910 and 1920, crop damage caused by floods and by insects, mainly the boll weevil, deepened an already severe economic depression in Southern agriculture. Destitute blacks swarmed to the North in 1915 and 1916 as thousands of new jobs opened and industries supplying goods to Europe, then embroiled in World War I. Blacks were confined mainly to overcrowded and dilapidated housing, and they were largely restricted to poorly paid menial jobs. But in the northern cities, the economic and educational opportunities for blacks were immeasurably greater than they had been in the rural South. There's a documented information trail that ran with the railroads. Um, most porters on trains were black. And they would go to the north on a train, pick up newspapers and information from cities up north, and then bring them down to the south. So there was this sort of almost in, informal information flow. You could tell how things were going in other cities by this network of railroad workers. But in the case of aluminum ore, they actually placed ads in southern newspapers asking for black workers to come up to East St. Louis to work in their plant. They knew that black workers being desperate for work and generally being mistreated in society would not attempt to unionize, where the white workers felt a little more bold and they could do that. With the influx of black migrants from the South, an ensuing battle between unionized white workers. Factory owners looked to poor blacks willing to cross the union picket line. The average white worker at the Hunter Meatpacking Plant was paid 35 cents an hour, compared to blacks who made 17 cents an hour. The colored guys that show their checks to the whites, and then a lot of the whites that show their checks to the color. The couple was branded or showing each other what you make. And so it didn't got, it got so that nobody never worried about what he made, just what you got. Companies adopted a policy of increasing the black labor force in order to limit the demands of white workers. Plants divided the riverfront town along racial lines. Newspapers began to embellish stories of criminal activity among blacks. The um, packing houses was importing blacks from the south. And the whites that were already here working resented that. The newspaper ran reports that there were enormous numbers of black males coming into town. How they did this, probably the way we figured it, is they would go down to the train station and just count the black males on the train. Now, any black male there might have been coming into town, but he might have also just been getting off the train to get some fresh air and get back on and go to Chicago. He might have been down there to meet somebody. He might even have been leaving town. But if they saw him there, they counted him. So there's supposed to be this over the over the, the months, there was supposed to be this huge number of young black males in East St. Louis looking for jobs. They thought probably 10,000 more, they reported probably 10,000 more than there actually, there actually was there. In Old East St. Louis, there was always a constant struggle between capital and labor. The big industries located in the city were controlled by outside interest people like industrialist Andrew Carnegie and former Secretary of Treasury Andrew Mellon. Whites in their rage during the labor dispute that happened in 1917 were infuriated that in fact whites were allowing blacks to migrate from the south displace them for for cheap wages in these places that they long uh, considered to be uh, their jobs 
their sources of employment and, and entities in which they were respected and that they would always have uh, uh, work and blacks were coming up displacing them and rather than take their rage out on the employers who sold them out, who betrayed them, who did they take it out on? The same way they always do historically on the poor black man who was merely trying to do for his family uh, what whites were trying to do for their families and that's provide a living. The race riot that would happen was a result of two different circumstances. Whites fearing that their livelihood would be altered by black migration and the history of black-white animosity that was nearing its apex. So, so it seems to me that, that this thing was generating some, some kind of head of steam and then the newspaper is reporting probably added to it so that when these when the strikers at the aluminum ore plant took off they they were already pretty well mentally armed for what they were going to do and and that's what they were going to go out and they were looking for all of these black males that they thought were going to take their jobs and and there may have been there may have been some black males imported with white males also from Chicago as strike breakers whites complained that blacks took advantage of northern freedom by refusing to follow segregation patterns prevalent in the South where they had come from. It was said that dirty Negroes sat all over cars, smelled of body odor, and exhibited loud and disruptive behavior in public. Many whites felt the blacks' challenge of the old social order was caused by their political power, which was a direct result of migration and residential segregation. I would have to speculate that life was better for some of the blacks who came, especially those who came from rural backgrounds, only because you were in an urban area and you had services available that would not have been available in the same capacity, if at all, in the rural south. But I don't think that coming to East St. Louis brought all of the freedoms that many of them hoped for because they went from I think many of them went from one difficult life to another difficult life. Some blacks, particularly those who were able to to maneuver through the educational system, maneuver through the political system and the social system, were able to advance some to some degree. But a large number of blacks remained of course trapped in underemployment and unemployment in the cities. Before the riots, whites charged that because of the ballot, Negroes had transformed from a subordinate to an insubordinate race. Dixie politicians suggested that if the North had denied political participation to blacks, the migration would never have happened. Racism was prevalent in the South as it is now in some spots. The Civil War still being fought. Black people were trying to survive. They had to live. They, had, they were sharecropping on some of the lands that they, the white folks didn't even own. They were just trying to get away from that for a better way of life for themselves and for their families and for future generations. They, they had to leave. They wanted to leave. They wanted freedom. They wanted to be treated with dignity. They wanted to be treated as people. They wanted a chance for their children to have a better life than they had. Over the course of two years as the black population increased, white animosity grew harsher and black-white eruption was almost inevitable. Racial outbreaks were common for American cities like East St. Louis. Being strangers in an unholy land caused many a black person to flee St. Louis to an even more volatile place, Chicago, Illinois. Well, a lot of people from, from the South, they, from Arkansas, chose St. Louis because it was a, a short trip. Mostly you find people in Chicago, African Americans in Chicago who migrated from the South, came from Mississippi and Alabama, and some from Georgia. Uh, Georgia Negroes oftentimes went up the East Coast, you know, to the Carolinas and up to New York City. Uh, Alabama and Mississippi Negroes came to Chicago through St. Louis, and some of them didn't have enough money to get to St. Louis, but you find most of the African Americans in this area from the South or from Arkansas or Mississippi. In fact, East St. Louis is almost 90% Mississippians. After hour bars, late night rendezvous with prostitutes, and wild gunplay was a sign of the times for the town. East St. Louis Mayor Fred Molman was a leader, seemingly restrained by the local industry, and did nothing to prevent the riot he knew was inevitable. There were certainly warning signs that this was coming. Um, first, the whole environment for the last few years in this region and really across the country 
race relations were strained. And then you had in May of 1917 a small uprising against blacks, nothing like the July riots, but it was almost a precursor. And it was well known, I think, by, by Mayor Molman of East St. Louis that he knew the day before that the riot was going to happen. And so I think there were both long-term signals and some short-term signals. They knew it was coming. It wasn't uh, direct fighting, uh, you know, any kind of open fighting. It was just that all of a sudden you start reading the newspaper, and every day, if you read, read the journal, every day, every day, every day, what you find out is there are two dead here, one here. Three days later, two more dead. And, you know, all of a sudden you add this up. In a month, you've got 10, 15 people dead. And then the next month, you've got another 10 or maybe, maybe 20 people dead. And all, this, now this seemed to be escalating as time was going on. Much of East St. Louis is quiet now. Industries have long gone, and labor strife is a thing of the past. But there are many problems within the city, and many of these problems stem from the race riots that happened more than 80 years ago. Black people couldn't go to the labor unions. They weren't allowed apprenticeships. They weren't allowed in the unions at, at the time, so politicians didn't do anything to make that any better. So they both were culprits at the time, especially the unions. On May 28, 1917, racial tensions heightened after a union home meeting downtown riled the city for Black scabs were the topic of discussion. Shortly after the meeting, whites began to attack blacks. But blacks quickly retaliated, and the National Guardsmen arrived in town before anyone was hurt. Well, they weren't called scabs, they were called survivors. Uh, people who had the jobs and didn't want them to work called them scabs, but they had to survive. Every man has to eat, has to feed his family. They weren't scabs, they were just trying to to do what the natural right to do. They were trying to pursue happiness, their God-given right. There was a strike at the aluminum ore plant in uh, East St. Louis, and um, one night after, in June, after a, a union meeting, the, uh, the uh, union people, some of them, not all of them, some of them broke into the armory and stole weapons, and then headed off downtown East St. Louis, ostensibly to kill black males, which they felt were, in fact, uh, being brought into town to take their jobs. Interestingly enough, uh, you know, one of the great tragedies of the whole thing was that the first two black males they killed were not even from East St. Louis. They were a family, a man, his wife, his daughter, and his son, and they had uh, been up in Alton all day. They're from St. Louis. They had been in Alton all day and just simply were on the tram coming back from Alton to, Saint, to St. Louis. And uh, these, these, uh, this mob uh, caught them and killed the, uh, the, the boy and uh, the father. They were not interested in killing women. They were only interested in the males who they thought were taking the job. The violence began the night of July 1st, 1917. A black Ford screeched down this residential district and fired shots into black homes. But no one was injured. Hours later, a similar car carrying two white men, detectives Frank Wadley and Samuel Coppage, drove into the black neighborhood. Still angered by the earlier outburst, Black gunmen were waiting and fired numerous shots into the car, killing the detectives. On the day of the riots, the event that actually triggered it was when two police officers were shot. Argument can be made whether it was intentional or mistaken identity, but it, it the, the, the case that, as I've seen it documented, is that it really was a case of mistaken identity, perhaps. The next day at East St. Louis City Hall, a bloodied and shot up vehicle sat outside the building. Whites were angered that blacks had the audacity to kill the policemen and began to pull innocent blacks off the street and beat them. The riot began in the business section where black pedestrians were outnumbered. Blacks had not expected their homes would be burned. Mostly made up of tinderbox shanties, they provided poor defense against gunshots and firebombs. My mother and father didn't realize that uh, the ride was on. They happened to be riding on a motorcycle, and someone threw a stick out the window. It was in the neighborhood near where white people were. And uh, they threw a stick out the window and hit my mother on her shoulder. And when they got home, they found out that the, their, that the ride was on. Yeah, I was just here. You didn't see the shooting. You just hear the shooting. You Every now and then you would see something, but the, the whites didn't come down for as we were. 
they would just shoot down in there. I could see the white men going back towards East St. Louis. And we saw the colors hollering and running and, and smoke. They were burning and setting things to fire. Them old piece of buildings. See, most of them buildings were built out of cardboard and paper. Some railroad streetcar names on the wood the building. Tar paper around a lot of them. And that made them smoke a lot, that tar paper. And that stuff, the wood stuff that was under it, and paper, made the building smoke. It was a heavy smoke. looked like it was a forest of fire. But we were back up on the bridge. That makes it, we could look down on it. About 7 o'clock that night, a mob set fire to sheds alongside the street where blacks had made a settlement. Orders were given to the military to surround the men and women who had been watching the actions of the mob and take them to the station. By this time, the entire business section of the city was in flames. The black-owned homes alongside Collinsville Avenue were burned. Firemen who attempted to fight the flames of the burning homes were warned to stop by the white mobs. Many blacks trapped in their homes preferred burning to death than facing the anger and bullets of the mob and remained in their fire-swept homes. White observers described the blacks as being scared to death and maintaining an absolutely passive attitude, hoping only for an opportunity to flee across from Mississippi to Missouri. People coming into town, praying and scared and run. It was a creek there, it was an old creek, and they were throwing a lot of them over in the creek there, called the Cokie Creek. And, uh, they would run them in there. I don't know where they throw them in there. They run them in there, but we didn't run because we would over, so call ourselves over across the railroad track. But you could stand up and look, you know, out and see different things across the track. Then uh, I heard a lot. People come in telling them what was happening. As they come through, they, they see different ones cut up and shot up and beat up. Yeah, and they would tell us, and I would sit there and listen to them telling us. And they were having prayer meetings at the church, praying for their hopes that they don't come down there to where we were at. The carnage would go on uncontested for days. This neighborhood, referred to as the South End, was hit the hardest in the riots. Many blacks who lived in this part of town offered the most resistance to the white mobs. True Light Baptist Church stood in defiance against the riots. Though in a different location, it still stands today. Beyond the riot zone, Black men in only a few instances organized small mobs which counterattacked sporadically. But they got guns and things and like that to, to fight back, see. And, and they would mowing them down like mowing down grass. But <laughs> uh, the meticians that have these wagons, you very dead folks, <laughs> they was all them guns. <laughs> and the deep girls over in St. Louis <laughs> and white folks as well. They loaded those things down, uh, the, the wagon down for them to bring over here for the Negro that's fighting back. One thing about a Negro enslaved, when, if you give him the tool, he'll, more, he'll mop up more white folks than you could get dragged from anyway. You just get joy out of doing that. Thomas O'Malley's account. It seemed as if the black people were all trying to flee or were waiting to be slaughtered. But the grassroots blacks had organized an immobilized force through Undertaker Green's funeral home in East St. Louis. What happened, they were pinned down in, uh, in different buildings and houses on Exchange Avenue. And he said to flush the men out because they couldn't, um, they couldn't uh, get the better of them at times in certain locations while they were fighting. So he said they, was, they went to snatching people's children and little children and throwing them up into the air, shooting them. City government and local police did nothing to curb the tide of violence. On July 2nd, more than 100 blacks barricaded themselves into two houses on Broadway, taking part in a shootout with an angry white mob. Whites who had not anticipated a strong resistance from blacks complained to militiamen that their lives were in danger and asked for help in flushing blacks from the shelters. The packing house where the people were working set up tents for people who were, had been working there, but they lived in East St. Louis to go to Brooklyn to, to stay until after the ride. So they put up the... I think it was Swift and Company put up uh, tents for the people to come up there to love the other state. I, I don't think the ride even got, the people even got a chance to start anything up there. As militiamen canvassed the area during the night for skirmishes and blacks were being evacuated from the areas, rioters in the crowd chanted death threats 
to those who would be bold enough to return to the city. Josephine Baker, a world-renowned singer from the town, hid in the basement of a shack while mobs pillaged and burned homes outside. She managed to escape death with the help of an unknown funeral director who took her across the Eads Bridge that led into Missouri. Some black funeral directors took matters into their own hands by sneaking guns and ammunition in coffins. William Nash, one of the first black funeral directors in town, was one of few prominent blacks in town. He built his business at the height of racial animosity. He was a soul brother, though it wasn't <laughs> known as such in those days. He was, he was one that was always for the rights of the black. And wherever he could uh, serve in the uh, city and the community, he participated. Shots were fired, homes were burned, and our place was burned. And uh, this was in July 1917. By early afternoon, several blacks were beaten and lay bloodied in the street. Mob leaders calmly shot and killed them. After victims were placed in an ambulance, there was cheering and clapping. One black man was dragged to a pole by a rope tied around his neck as the crowd screamed to hang him. But the man's life was spared for the moment when National Guardsmen saved him from the crowd. The man later died from his injuries during the attempted hanging. Here, he lost everything just about in the ride. And just like starting business anew. And you can't be too happy with that. But he was determined to have his business and make a go of it. He gave his life too, till he died in 56. They were shot in the back, shot in the face, butchered, mutilated thrown in the Mississippi River, I'm talking about innocent black men, women, uh, babies, and children. Uh, so we, when we refer to it as a riot, it is, it is off the mark in terms of what really happened. And I think by and large, when we not only look at uh, the history of riots in East St. Louis, but the history of riots in Detroit and throughout the country, uh, it has been too often sugar-coated. Many of the dead are buried here in Booker T. Washington Cemetery among the nameless and faceless crowd, while other remains lay at the bottom of Cahokia Creek near the Mississippi River. Shortly after the riots, several horribly mutilated floaters were found in the creek. While whole bodies had surfaced, many felt that burned bodies would never come to the surface. The official count, nine whites murdered, 39 Negroes dead, hundreds injured. But that's obviously false. Uh, they were fishing bodies out of the Kokia, Kokia River for weeks. Uh, there's no telling how many people fled, wounded, hurt into St. Louis, went across, I think, the East Bridge probably, or, or out to places like Lebanon, Illinois, where there were, where there were tram tracks and they could get on and get out of the city. May have been, may have been injured. The estimates run that there may be as many as 2,000 people killed. It looked like that creek was just running blood. It was just that bloody. And for them to say 45, Blacks were killed, it was, that's an understatement. It was much more than that. The number was greater than that. I don't think we'll ever know the truth of how many people were killed or injured. The fact that, they re, that the official statistics reported under 50 dead seems almost ludicrous considering the amount of, the number of people involved and the amount of damage that resulted. I'm quite sure the death toll must have been in the hundreds because bodies weren't recovered and, and, and there was a fear of going to hospitals if you were injured and it was just a really, really messy, messy time. The Congressional Committee investigating the riots found inconsistencies with the East St. Louis coroner's death records. Much to the committee's astonishment, black corpses were gathered much like the remains of hogs. In order to save the county money, post-mortem examinations were only conducted on a few bodies. Many ended up in Potter's Field. The county's coroner also declared that a one-year-old boy and a two-year-old girl died after being shot in the head. Another child was found in the ashes of a burned-out home where the little boy was found hiding underneath his bed. Many political leaders were appalled at the massacre in East St. Louis. Former President Teddy Roosevelt even voiced his outrage at the episode in a speech praising the labor movement. 
So you better listen to remember who Teddy Roosevelt was. Teddy Roosevelt was the man that uh, led the charge of San Juan Hill, right? But he also had black soldiers in front of him at the charge of San Juan Hill. Actually, history will tell you that the African Americans actually won the Battle of San Juan Hill, and Teddy Roosevelt praised them at the time. But when he got back to Washington, D.C., the racist faction in Washington and the rest of the country made Teddy Roosevelt denounce African American soldiers and said they were cowards and so forth. No, he did nothing uh, positive in this country to me whatsoever, do I think. But it was President Woodrow Wilson's refusal to get involved in the riots that drew the ire of blacks namely Crisis Editor and NAACP co-founder W.E.B. Du Bois. Du Bois wrote that in conflict over bread and meat, Negroes were killed because they were black and strike breakers. The Negroes fought. They grappled with mobs like beasts at bay. They drove them back from their homes and piled the white dead on the street. But the cunning mob caught the black men between the factories and their homes, where they were armed only with their dinner pails. You can't get more racist than a Woodrow Wilson. You can't get more of a segregationist as a Woodrow Wilson. You can't get more of a hated person or a hatred person with hate in their heart than a Woodrow Wilson. He was the bigot of his time. He didn't try to hide his hatred of African Americans or any person of color. He was the person that did, I think, set back African Americans more than any other person except Abraham Lincoln, who was supposed to be the, the, freedom of black folks, but he did more harm to black folks than anybody else in history. Here's two of the most powerful men at the time in the Senate and the White House, and they can't stop it, because once these things get going, I'm reminded of the, of the and I'm talking in very general historical terms here, but I'm reminded of the, uh, uh, of the, the war for independence. Uh, the people leading the revolt against England did not want to separate from England. Franklin and, and those people did not did not want a separate nation. All they wanted was better representation. But once that thing got going, uh, once it spread, the, the fever spread uh, to the populace, uh, they couldn't stop it. And in fact, it led Franklin to say, we had all better hang together now. We're going to hang separately. Because uh, they just couldn't stop it. They didn't want it, but they couldn't stop it, so they had to go through it. Woodrow Wilson was gaining many friends at home and abroad after he led the US in the war to end all wars. But it was with the black community that Wilson was out of touch. There was a very interesting political cartoon which came out right after the riot in a New York newspaper. It's a black woman kneeling down, pleading with Woodrow Wilson. In the background, East St. Louis is burning. And Woodrow Wilson is holding a document with his famous edict, the world must be made safe for democracy. And the poor woman is begging, Mr. President, America must be made safe for democracy. I think we always tend to want to think that people in power, with that kind of power, president or whatever, uh, can do all kinds of magic things because he has power, without realizing that he many times is as constrained by his power as, as, he, you know, as, as it is available to him. Wilson was probably the only president who was a brilliant student and teacher as well as a statesman. He had been a college professor, president of Princeton University, and the author of books on American government. Oh, I don't know about him being the first person to segregate the White House. He was the first one to introduce, I think, mass racism to the White House and hatred of black people to the White House, which Wilson was a terrible person. Uh, history proved that, although they tried to soft pedal it, but he was the one that uh, took away and allowed so many uh, endowment programs of black people. He's the one that didn't allow uh, black people to, to become a free person or a, a, to, to rise to the whole potential. He's the one that segregated black people and keep them, kept them segregated and made times very, very hard for them. In protest of the treatment of blacks in East St. Louis, black leaders with thousands of New York blacks walked the streets of New York in unison for an event that would be referred to as the March of Silence. I don't think that in the case of East St. Louis that you could have prevented it through the mechanism of, of government, at least at the local level. The local government in East St. Louis was not designed to serve people, it was designed to serve business. East St. Louis government was dedicated to a good business environment where railroads operated easily and freely and industries were able to produce their product with minimum 
hesitation. Shortly after the riot, stockyards and factories were in disarray. Deserted because the few blacks left in East St. Louis refused to work because factories had taken no additional steps to protect them. White union members remained angry at black workers for being scabs and nearly breaking the will of the union. Black people couldn't go to the labor unions. They weren't allowed apprenticeships. They weren't allowed in the unions at, at the time. So politicians didn't do anything to, to make that any better. So they both were culprits at the time, especially the unions. Although race was the primary culprit that triggered the riots, scholars have tried to come up with answers as to what really happened. It is believed that newspapers contributed to social tension by publishing rumors instead of facts. Over the years, many theories have been brought out as to what started the riots. The basic date that people give for the day of the riot is July 2nd, uh, 1917. And during the war, there was a uh, Nazi sub that uh, sneaked into the port of New Orleans and dropped off about eight saboteurs. And these saboteurs each had a key industrial military complex that they were going to blow up. And what I mean by that is uh, when the war came along, East St. Louis stopped making its domestic type of products and converted over to making wartime products, uh, tanks and guns and ships and things like that. Um, and out of all the places they targeted in the United States, with only eight saboteurs, one of the places was East St. Louis, and his target was the aluminum ore plant. And uh, that kind of shows the industrial prowess of East St. Louis back then. Trials ruled the fall of 1917. State and federal investigators looked near and far for a culprit. What they found was a radical African-American dentist named Dr. Leroy Bundy. Bundy was a community leader, a politician, and a freedom fighter. I think the investigation was lax for several reasons. First, I don't know that the lives of blacks were valued by those who were charged with the investigation. I think that it was to the advantage of elected and business leaders to make the event as small and insignificant as possible. I think that it was a very painful time for everyone that there was probably a desire just to get on with business and not make much of it and there was just not this sense of social justice that we have today judge kennesaw mountain landis u.s federal judge presided over the proceedings for trials heading to the slaughter of blacks and whites but a disproportionate amount of blacks went to trial no trial usually of african american in this country is going to be fair especially one that if a person is involved in a riot. Anytime there's any damage done to property or a white person or another person, a black man will not, black man or woman or person will not get a fair trial. No, there were nothing fair about those trials. Leroy Bundy, the good doctor, was a fall guy. He was sentenced to life imprisonment for inciting a riot and being indirectly responsible for the loss of white life. Later, the verdict was overturned. You had a lot of people, but I, I feel that they operated in small clusters, that you had a Lithuanian community that may not have, have worked well with the German community, or you had a black community which may not have worked well with some of the white community, and you had some of these, these small little circles of people who practiced and kept their culture from the old country or from wherever they came. And it didn't necessarily lend well to a melting pot. More than 70 years later after the racial incident, the River City, ironically an all-black town today, still struggles.